A very good uh, evening uh, to all our viewers and uh, welcome to this week's edition of uh, The Agenda. My name is Taiwan Jabela, your host, and uh, tonight uh, we are discussing the issue of uh, the veterinary cotton fence, also known as the red line that has been in the news and uh, you know, uh, induced a lot of debate uh, in recent days. Um, and to, joy, uh, to, to discuss that with me tonight on the show is uh, Waduva Kaumbi. He's, uh, he's a farmer and also a business executive. Uh, and of course, we are welcoming back uh, Dimulukeni Nawiyoma. He is uh, an activist of uh, the affirmative repositioning movement. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And the young man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, thank you very much for sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, now, I mean, we, I think the, the, the issue has been, uh, the, this issue of the red line has been, of course, very contentious for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But uh, Job Ampanda brought it back into spotlight when uh, he, he had his meat products tossed away by the officials at Oshivelo there and uh, he's now suing the authorities and uh, hoping not only for justice in that particular case of his but i think he's trying to get overall victory mm. to have that fence eventually removed mm. uh, Wadua, let's start with you because you i presume you farm south of the red line yes um what would it mean if that red line was to be removed in 90 days let's start with 90 days that job Ampana is asking for yes yeah no, thanks to you and also welcome to my colleague there. Yeah. Uh, as you said, I'm a farmer and maybe just to say that my farm is actually bordering the red line. So I'm not very, very far from the red line. So, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, because I'm in the uh, Rotfontein uh, district. So mm -hmm. my farm is uh, neighboring the Tsungke communal area. So okay. the Roydach checkpoint red line, my farm is actually, I actually my my eastern border is actually the red line okay. know, and we are within what they call the buffer zone so oh, i'm yes. also subject to uh quarantining i need yes. i cannot sell my cattle directly i need to quarantine them i've got quarantine facilities on my farm mm. so i need to quarantine them for at least 30 days mm -hmm. before i can sell mm -hmm. so that is the only slight advantage i have over those who are let's say on the other side of the on the wrong side <laughs> so <laughs> say, the of the of the community of the veterinary court on fence yes. uh, who have no possibility at all mm -hmm. of selling it you know despite the quarantine facility so yeah. and what happened is that um look the the red line is that it has maybe outlived its usefulness mm -hmm. you know um i don't think somebody in his right mind will support the, the existence of the red line. Mm. Um, I think the, the idea is that in 1896, that's when the, the mm. rinderpest occurred, mm. you know, and mm. the, the, the disease is said to have come from the northern parts mm. of Africa. Yes. Um, and then it came into southern Africa, into Namibia, and also ultimately into, into South Africa. Mm. And it decimated a large herd of cattle. Mm. I know among my own people, the Wairero, we yes. lost more than 80% yes. of the yes. cattle you know, yes. due to the rinderpest. Mm -hmm. And I think there's fear, because at that time, of course, vaccination programs were not you know, very much in effect. Mm. So the Germans were, you know, I think out of uh, desperation, they then put up. In those days, there was not really a fence, but it's more like control points. Mm. And they mm. used the military to control access from the northern parts or eastern parts into into the southern parts. Yes. So that was the initial uh, intention of the of the of the red line. Mm -hmm. But we know, of course, that later on, then it became a political tool, mm -hmm. of actually dividing the north and the south, mm -hmm. and you know the arrangement between the Germans and the Portuguese, you know, to try and sandwich the, the Ovambo, the northern mm -hmm. populations, you know, mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And you know, we know that also during the the uprising of 1904, yeah. we know that some of our northern comrades who wanted to come and join the uprising then the Germans used the, the red line actually as a tool yes. to, to destroy that solidarity. You mm -hmm. know? So mm -hmm. we know the political reasons. And then, of course, the South Africans then came also and they, and they used that for political reasons as mm -hmm. well and military reasons. You know? mm -hmm. So then you find that the northern part of the red line was then you called the operational area. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the war against the, 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 red, the red danger of the Ruecha Far was happening. You know? mm -hmm. So in short, then, to come to your question is that I personally am for the removal of the of the red line. I mm. think it, the question is just the modalities. How do we go about mm. that? Because now, in 1896, it was the Rinder Pest. It has now been, I think, in 2010, 11, they said it was officially mm. taken care of. Now, mm. you know, so it doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. The only two uh, diseases that we now have is the foot and mouth disease, and there's what they call the pleuro. Uh, the contagious bovine pleuronumary uh, uh, disease, mm -hmm. which is, with these are very infectious, and, and they are now using the cordon, uh, the veterinary cordon fence to control that. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem is that, especially the, 
the northern, the direct north, the, let's call it the central north, mm. is not so much a problem. I think they're more concerned about the eastern part, the, the Zambezi area, where mm. you have the buffaloes free roaming and so on, because they are the major, major cause mm. of the foot and mouth disease. The rest are more like buffer zones, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So the question is that how do we then control that uh, if we remove the red fence yes. or the red line? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, I think, maybe the discussion now we can have and say, look, yes, because ultimately it's about disease control. It's the vaccinations, yes. you know, yes. it's about quarantine facilities and all of those things there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you look at it that, according to statistics, we have about 2.7 million uh, herd, cattle herd in Namibia. Mm -hmm. Only 35 or 36 percent is mm. actually south of the red line, mm -hmm. about 1 million. So mm -hmm. the rest, 1.7 million, is north of the red line. Yes. So the majority of the cattle in Namibia is actually north of the red line. So yes. you can see that if you open that, you have a huge, mm. you know, uh, herd of cattle that we can then use to actually then increase in our GDP and so on and so on. So yes. I think in the end, it's really part of the whole agrarian revolution or reform in Namibia that we can look at all of these aspects. There. Sorry, to Indeed. take taking too long. That's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the Mulugan is, is, is not a it's not a fiction that uh, uh, foot and mouth disease does exist, and um, it's also not incorrect to say that um, it has the red line has helped uh, keep that virus on the other side of town, if, if I may use that phrase. Um, so, so amidst those realities, how do we handle the issue of the red line? I know that you are generally opposed to it, have, <laughs> to it being there. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Toivo. I think the context that was set was, was very important. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Mr. Kaumbi says he's, he's old, and that, that's what I say, there's wisdom in the gray hair. Yeah. So, and, and when we debate, it shouldn't be on an emotional perspective. Yeah. We must have the context of the red line. So yeah. we now know that the context of the red line was because of a disease outbreak in 1896. Mm. Uh, and then thereafter, it was then used as a political tool. So what we are debating now in terms of the red line, in the context of general Namibians, they, they are failing to understand that the, the, the red line was a control measure mm. used at a particular point and abused at a particular point, and we maintain this abuse. Mm. So what we are speaking about, when we say about the foot and mouth disease, and let me just demonstrate something for you uh, quickly. When I go to Odibo, I go with five pairs of shoes. So when I come back from Odibo, I come back with my very, very same five pairs of shoes, mm. but I'm just wearing one, so four in the bag. Mm. So when I reach Oshivelo, they said, no, no, you must now step out uh, that disinfection. You step on it, the tires of the car, then I go. Mm. So immediately I pass Oshivelo and I go to this guy's farm mm. and I put on my other pairs of shoes that have not been disinfected. Are we saying that we are controlling the measures? effectively mm. or are we simply saying we, we have a gimmick that we are trying to portray in the in the minds of people and say we are fighting against foot and mouth disease mm. so we, we must have practical solutions so why are we saying or why are we bringing the central debate of the red line mm. one we are now speaking about we are not simply saying remove the red line mm. we are simply saying now if we are able to open up a market to an extra 1.7 million or 2 million heads of cattle what does it mean economically for the country? But when you are opening it up, you are not opening it up loosely because we know food and mouth generally is a problem in Angola. Mm. Those of us in Zamb Zambezi, those of us in Odibo are closer to the borders of Angola. And in fact, some of our cattle are in Angola. So when we bring those cattle over, the quarantine facilities, are we saying that as a government and we want to open up to a 2 million mm. uh, population of cattle, uh, are we saying that we are unable to put a facility? So the debate shouldn't be about uplifting or not uplift uh, or, or, or maintaining. So we must look into what are the facilities that we are capable of putting up in place? Mm. What is the time frame that we need to put up these facilities? Mm. How do we increase the, the quality of beef? And, and remember, it's not just about two million cattle. It's about the quality of beef. And later on, we must be able to discuss and say who then is the in the end result is a beneficiary. Mm. I can even tell you the farmers on the south side of the red line don't get uh, their fair share of what they ought to get. They sell their cattle, what, $25 uh, per kilo or 30, but let's go in the shop. You get 
per kg is already over a hundred dollars so that markup that goes in there who is the actual beneficiary of that meat mm -hmm. so ideally what we need to be discussing is, is, is first, I want to take the component of the actual meat mm. in terms of disease control, but then later on, let's discuss about what has the political red line brought, you know, and why it needs to be uplifted now, because it, it's, it's segregating a very huge community mm. out of the mainstream economic sphere and how we can grow our GDP and how we can also access to financing mm. and also just develop communities on the other side of the red line. Indeed. Well, the, 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 there's a case reported again this week uh, in Zambezi of uh, foot and mouth disease. Assuming that we didn't have this line there today, and a case like that gets reported in that region, what would have been the implication of that? Yeah, look, the thing is that, because I now I was just reading somewhere also that the meat board has appointed a, a veterinary consultant. I think it was last year, November. Mm -hmm. The idea was for them to investigate because ultimately it's about disease control. Yes. I think the red line has also made us a bit lazy, you know, in the sense that because it's a physical boundary, so we know that look, it won't go through the checkpoint. So the 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 emphasis should have been on uh, beefing up. Sorry for the pun. You know the the veterinary uh, measures in 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 the whole of Namibia actually, especially in the border areas, because we know, as you said, in Angola, especially because you look for Angola, cattle farming is not really a priority. You know they have the priority elsewhere. Whereas to Namibia and Botswana, it is really a mainstay of our economy, even though it's a small contribution to GDP, is still under ten percent. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that it's, it's a mainstay of our, even the export earnings are almost four, more than four billion Namibia dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we need to look at how do we beef up this, you know. Mm -hmm. So a case like this, for instance, could have been controlled if we had, for instance, an early warning system. Because we know that the, it's now because of the free roaming buffaloes. Mm -hmm. And also not only there, but I remember even in the Okakarara area, there were some buffaloes. I don't know where they escaped from. Yeah, just be that, yeah, just uh, because of the, because the presence of the buffaloes, they, they stopped, you know, selling any cattle. And, mm -hmm. and people suffered as a result, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So the red line as itself is not a foolproof measure, you know, to control against this. Um, at least fortunately now we have also a school of veterinary medicine now in Namibia. So I think we have a lot more output of veterinarians now qualified and so on, and also animal scientists. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to focus now on, 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 on increasing uh, the vaccination programs because they are what they call these uh, <laughs> uh, immune, uh, immune uh, 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 naive cattle. Some of the cattle that have never been vaccinated in their whole life. Mm -hmm. So if we beef up and, and government can spend money on that, I mean, uh, instead of really, as, as we were saying earlier, the, 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 the huge market, the potential that is there in the north. Mm -hmm if we convert that into a monetary value, that's a lot of money. So if you take a fraction of that and spend that money on, on actually the, the, the required uh, veterinary measures, yeah. increase the vaccinations, you know, uh, instead of, because the rest of us, we only vaccinate once a year, yeah. normally in the winter period, you know. There, you could make, there could be vaccinations a quarterly on a quarterly basis, you know. Uh, there could be ways of, uh, but maybe study, but what causes what is actually this foot and mouth disease? Yes. If we could, if, 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 if efforts uh, could have been taken uh, in those days because it affected the whole continent in terms of the Rinderpest. Yes. And it, it is now claimed that it has been totally eliminated. Why can we not have measures to eliminate foot and mouth disease? Because that is really the primary disease that is now left that is causing this problem. Yes. And are we really saying that it's something that we cannot control? You know? So maybe uh, to come back to your question is that I think for me is that there are still ways, you know, there's still a lot of room for improvement, uh, the quality control in terms of the veterinary aspects, and especially if people come to know. And if you open up, because now you have these people north of the veterinary cordon fence, or depending where you are in the country, some are east of the yeah. <laughs> veterinary cordon fence, um, is to say, because there's been, it's been lax, you know, because they knew that, look, their cattle will not be sold in, in the lucrative uh, overseas markets. That's really where the money is coming from, is in the lucrative uh, overseas markets. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we then can spend money then to, to improve that and say, look, but how do we fight? I've not seen concerted efforts really uh, to, to fight this food and mouth disease and there's uh, the pneumonia, you know, the pneumonia disease that they, because those are really the only two diseases that are still causing this problem. Um, so then maybe your question is that I think we can still treat those, you know, we can say, look, okay, these things are coming and then maybe uh, the Zambezi can become a focal area, you know. Yes. 
because we know that is where the problem really is. There is just, you know, because of the proximity to Angola and so on, you know, um, if you look at the Kunene, it's not so much of a problem, but because the, the line was drawn in such a way to exclude all of that part there, you know, uh, and you find that some people now, for instance, who buy commercial farms uh, south of the red line, and, and they had large herds in, say, Kunene or whatever, they cannot bring those herds, you know, so they have to sell them. And because they're from the uh, red, uh, northern red line, they have a very small amount of money. Uh, that they get relative to those in the south, and now they must buy again, you know, to, to restock. And they lose a lot of money in the process. I know government had a facility to try and, and bridge that gap, but even then that did not really help, you know. So I think really, really my main focus is on, 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 on helping that. And I know that there were some proposals to create uh, uh, FMD free zones within those areas. And say, look, for instance, we take an area of I don't know how many thousands of hectares, you know, and we say, look, this area now we shall use it. And then maybe we keep some of the cattle in that uh, facility. And, and, you know, because the quarantine facility is to, to, to be able to not only immunize and, and, you know, try and apply some veterinary techniques to, to ensure that the disease, uh, the cattle or the animals are not uh, affected by the disease, but also to allow them time to see whether the symptoms, you know, uh, coming out during that period. And those we can do, you know, we can, uh, because that's what I have on my farm. I have a, as a private person, I have a quarantine facility. So the idea is then it, it gives you the opportunity to look at it and say, look, okay, but this, this cow here or whatever is uh, displaying symptoms of this disease, so maybe you take it out. And then also you isolate it from the rest of the herd on the farm. But ultimately, you're still going to sell it. So I don't understand why we cannot create similar facilities, because I know there were some quarantine facilities in the north, yes. other places, but they're not being used effectively. Yes. Because if we can use those, and then we can actually then release and free the rest of the cattle and actually bring them Indeed. to the side of the... the, the Indeed. Sorry for... <laughs> no, 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 long way, yeah, yeah. No, we are good, we are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dimburgan, we have two, two or just slightly one, over one minute before we go for a break. But <clears throat> give me, in your, in your view, the, the practical solutions to this impasse. This thing has gone on for too long. Uh, people are mourning about its uh, presence there and everything. Um, do we just wake up one morning and say enough now and remove the, the, the fence or what is the most practical solution to deal with this matter? Well, Toivo, growing up, um, there would always be uh, something that we call in vernacular omanga. We didn't understand what omanga was until we, we grew up and we now begin to understand the context of food and mouth disease. Yeah. So at every outbreak, government already, already has investments in terms of vaccination of cattle mm. uh, around the, the northern side of the area. So what we then need to do, because remember everyone now uh, from the north and the east and the, uh, have, have learned what the south is doing in terms of quality of the beef. Mm. I am a farmer in the northern side, but I would never graze or farm the same way how my grandfathers were farming. So in terms of farming techniques, we have also improved. Mm. Uh, we buy feed we buy everything, fodder and all these things, Luciana, just to take care of our own cattle. Why? Yeah. Because we have understood the, the quality that this uh, product can give to our livelihoods. Mm. It, it's surprising to know that, uh, particularly the Ovaherero speaking people, some of them have never uh, looked for a job, mm. but they've managed to take through their kids up to university. Some of them are doctors today, mm. just merely by selling cattle mm. or heads of, of cattle. Now, what we have conceptualized in the process is to say that we need to improve. In fact, we need to go on a radical agrarian reform policy. Mm. What would this policy uh, entail? It mm. entails the, the, the types of farming. Mm. So for you to want to participate, and, and not everybody wants to participate in the trade. Mm. For you to participate in the trade, number one, you must then be able to meet sp specific requirements. Mm. But there's then Toivo who says, look, I have 300 uh, heads of cattle, mm. I have 50 goats, mm. but I'm subjected to go and buy meat which is 100 uh, per kilo mm. in ShopRite. Mm. So alternatively, if I can be allowed to take my one goat, slaughter it at home, put it in a deep freeze, transport it into Windhoek, not for resale, mm. but to generally feed my family. So even if this goat was infected in the north, mm. it would still be infected when it comes to Vinduk and is going to be 
<laughs> infecting me. Mm. But because there's no, it's, it's not like we are saying we are putting up controlled measures to test the meat when we, are, when we reach Oshivelo. Mm. So all we are asking in, in this quest around the red line mm. is to address two things for now in terms of the meat products. Mm. One, let's put up practical measures. Those practical measures have already been there. The, those omangas have already been there for vaccination. Mm. So during that period, we must then provide those underutilized quarantine facilities. Meat cohesa, some mm. of them. Mm. We hear now that they're opening one in, in uh, Katima. Mm. So all those facilities should be made available and also adopt an agrarian reform in terms of uh, cattle farming mm. and also teaching our people new ways of farming, those that are interested in farming. Yeah. Those of us who are simply saying, look, if I spend $100 per kilo to enjoy good beef, why must I, if I have already 200 in the village, not just slaughter one and bring them to my house? And I, I use them specifically just for that. And I'm not interested in trading, but I'm, it's, it's for consumption. I'll, Maybe, stop, I'll, stop, I'll stop you there briefly. Yes. Hold that thought for me. We'll go for a break and then we'll continue the conversation. We continue with the, the agenda and uh, what is on the agenda tonight, of course, is the subject of uh, the red line, also formerly called the veterinary cotton fence. Before I go back to Wadova, let me talk to you still, uh, um, um, Dimbulukeni. When at the subsistence, you were getting into the subsistence uh, dimensions of this whole thing. Yes. I mean, Myself, 2013, I believe, I had, um, and I was really naive. I didn't understand all these restrictions, or maybe I just forgot. So there's a woman who lives in Hakana, and I went to the village, and at the village, uh, the, the neighbor said, you know, her, her, the, the woman who lives in Windu, one of her pigs died in the village. Um, it got stuck in the wires or something, something, the fence, and then it died. And traditionally, if this thing belongs to you, you, you get to get some portion of it. So they said, oh, you are going back to Vindu, you know, take uh, this much uh, consignment of meat and take it to her and tell her that her pig has died. Uh, it was a bit dried. Um, the police officers and all those uh, colleagues there, you know, asked me to open my boot. They looked at, they inspected, found that meat, and um, I saw them literally throwing it away in uh, this uh, 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 wall there. Mm. Uh, they, they put it, they, they threw it in there. Probably some people, <laughs> they would have gone there to take it back and eat it yeah. themselves. So, so this is not a, it's not just a, this phase doesn't just affect the economic dimensions of uh, farmers. Uh, it affects also the, 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 the domestic livelihoods of, of people. Uh, what can you say about that aspect of, uh, of this fence? And that is where I was getting into and saying that, you see, it's not, that is a practical example of our uh, cultural aspect. Mm. Even if it was my dog, you must bring me something uh, that signifies my departure yes. with my 
a specific animal. Mm. So it's, it's customary how we do that. Now, our brothers in Zambezi, mangoes, they cannot bring mangoes to this side of the fence. So it's not just about the meat. We are now moving into mangoes, mm. ideally because the trees and the cattle uh, meet at some point. And, and I gave a practical example and said, if I went with five pairs of shoes, I've walked throughout. And even when I come back, I bring the same shoes. It's not because I, maybe because I'm coming to the city, but if I was going to a, a farm, so I would have carried the particles of that disease. So it, it it's ordinarily does not uh, have practical sense in how we want to fight mm. uh, for foot and mouth. Mm. But Maybe to move away from that, Toivo, as we speak about the livelihoods of people. Yes. Our infrastructures that we construct, as per the political aspect of the red line that affects us now economically, even if you put up a double-story house, I feel sorry for those that have put up double-story, as you get into Andangwa, as you pass, uh, I think, Komte Omnime, it's a beautiful double-story house on the right. So that house economic value, even if you have put in one million to put up that structure, it's like you've taken one million and you went to Swakopmund and you put it in the ocean. Mm. Because it carries no economic value because mm. of the red line. Mm. So even the financial institutions are conditioned in a manner that you cannot, there's no bankability on infrastructures on the other side of the red line if they do not find themselves in the confines of a local authority. Mm. So as much as we are saying that uh, the red line must stay, people must also then understand that if I need to have a 5.2 million bank loan mm. and I have put up a 3 million worth of a structure in my village, I'm unable to access that 5.2 million to even just put up a factory mm. uh, for my people in the village. Mm. So ideally, the, the red line has superseded the disease control and has gotten into the other aspects mm. Unfortunately, our people, I think one of my uncle, when he passed on and he was married uh, to, 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 to his wife, um, unfortunately, you know, because we come from that side, everything must happen that side. Mm. Unknowingly, to them, they thought they, they were married in community of property. It's only when uh, we, we now need to discuss who's taking what car, who's taking the house, who's taking what. And he says, no, no, they were married in community of property. No, no, one lawyer said, look. You are on this side of the red line. Unfortunately, you ought to have put side. a print up when you're on the other side mm -hmm. uh, or get married on the other side and mm -hmm. put a print up on it. But unfortunately, yeah. it has even gotten into homes. And I think 2005, seven, when the news officially broke and people got to learn about it, it brought havoc in people's houses. Mm. So we, we need to understand the context in which we are trying to, to, to speak to the red line and say the political aspect mm. of the red line has also then infringed on rights of people. Mm. So why must we continuously uh, defend this invincible line that has conditioned all of us mm. into poverty? Indeed. Madhula, <coughs> Madhula you are um, also known as uh, not just a farmer, you are also a, a pan-Africanist man. And um, we know that, for example, uh, that this line, and you delved into it a little bit earlier, how this line was also used as a symbol to divide people. Um, one, of the, one of the cardinal uh, importance, if you like, of that line was uh, to entrench the, the contract labor system, yes. where you may not cross that line unless there was a, a job. You, you, you couldn't go out job hunting. You could only go once there's a job granted for you there. Um, so, like Dembloguini is saying, so it's, so it's no longer just um, a, a disease control uh, demarcation. It's a huge, huge socio-political tool that we are still hanging on to. Uh, do you think that uh, it's time that we start conversing about more than just the disease and really look into other things? So that there's a broader understanding of this, uh, of this line. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's what I was saying earlier, that I think this thing has uh, degenerated, of course, you know, into, a, a, like you say, a tool for political and, and socioeconomic control. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is the sad part, you know. Um, and that is what I was saying earlier, that the discussion should not be about whether 
we need a red line or not, because clearly we don't need that, you know. Or the, the, the only thing is that how do we then replace it instead of uh, rushing into just removing it, you know. And maybe the other point is also that, and I think uh, Jimbo also referred to that, I think what the other fear of, of people also south of the red line is that, because like I mentioned earlier, we have about 1.7 million uh, you know, cattle on the other side. Mm. Now, if you open the floodgates, that means that now you are flooding the market as well. So mm. the prices will obviously also be affected adversely. And, and that is one of the fears, you know, mm. that uh, because now uh, the prices now are actually not 25 anymore. No? Mm. They have gone to more than 50. Mm. There's some auctions now because of the, obviously of the previous drought, people are now in the process of restocking. So the, there's not I mean, much, enough cattle actually now in the market. Mm. And as a result, the prices have gone down. It's very lucrative now, south of the red line to sell at this stage. And mm -hmm. if people are not careful, some people may actually sell all the cattle just to raise the money. <laughs> yeah. To the extent that I think now they are trying to buy cattle actually from Botswana mm -hmm. in order to, to, to bridge that gap. So now, and that is where the other advantage can come in and to say, look, instead of fearing uh, the, the, the adverse impact on the price, mm -hmm. once you open the floodgates, you know, uh, after removing the, the, the red line, is to look actually into uh, greater access to markets. Mm. The Chinese market alone can absorb all the cattle in Namibia and, 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 st and they still look for more, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, the European Union, once we assure them of the quality, everything really is about quality control, mm. it's about uh, traceability, that's why we have the ear tags and so on. And Dimbu mentioned the earlier that, and, and I did also talk about the, the broader agrarian reform, mm. you know, um, that the moment you empower people and they start to see the value of investing in their livestock mm. and they see the commensurate uh, uh, income, yeah. they will get into that. I can tell you now that if you go to a lot of these shows in the, a lot of these communal areas now, south of the red line, yeah. I sometimes wonder who is really the commercial farmer here. Mm. Mm. I'm supposed to be the commercial farmer just because I have a freehold farm. Mm. But if you look at the quality of the animals that are there, because people have woken up now. Yeah? Mm. These, these guys now, they know all the names of the vaccines, they know all the, the feed, yeah. they know all the tricks and techniques that are there in order to improve the quality of the herd, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so therefore that if we can do the same things on the other side as well, and say, look guys, the main problem why you've been treated as uh, suffering from, what is that thing there in the Bible they used to have, there's a <laughs> disease that people, you know, leper, the leprosy, <laughs> like the modern lepers, you know, there's, there's a leprosy, yeah. it's because of the quality of the disease aspect. Yeah. And that is why also people are talking about, maybe instead of talking about uh, selling the livestock on the hoof or as live animals, maybe we look at commodity trading or look at products, beef mm. products. Mm. Because pre products you can control. You will be able to, to certify whether these products are disease-free or not. Yeah, yeah. And then once the certificate is issued by an independent you know, uh, uh, entity that can certify, then, then the meat can be sold. Yeah, you know? yeah. But uh, maybe as the, as the live animal, they, they become a bit more problematic. But mm. all of this, my, my conviction is that all of these things can be resolved. Yes. There must just be that political will to say, and, and, the, and, and, and the investment that must be made, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think once uh, people have seen that, uh, once people have realized, and the example that he was giving there earlier, you know, mm -hmm. to say, if I want to bring, uh, for instance, if I'm buying uh, meat at the, at the butchery for $100 per kilogram, mm -hmm. yet I have that, you know, on my farm, mm -hmm. and yet I'm, I'm not allowed to bring it, I can bring that. And that's how many of us survive, you know, mm -hmm. you bring meat from your own farm and then for your own consumption. Mm -hmm. um, just just hundred dollars for the meat, but if you look at Beltong, Beltong is up to three hundred dollars per kilogram, you yeah. know. <laughs> so that's a lot of money, you know. So so and that is where I think then we need to look at and maybe we at the the at the risk of uh, repeating ourselves mm -hmm. is that the broader once we look at the broader agrarian reform or even the agrarian revolution for that matter, once we start uh, getting to people to understand that even the so-called subsistence farming is not really subsistence if you look at it that way. Yes. And he was mentioning the example also that now we have people, in the past when I was growing up, uh, you visit a, a home of Vajero people, when you leave, you would always get a kagot. You know, these days you don't because yeah. uh, <laughs> a goat, you know, a will, 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 will fetch you two thousand sure, dollars. You know, sure. so you won't just give it to your friend. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the commercial aspects of the farming has taken root now, even mm. in the subsistence farming mm -hmm. areas, mm -hmm. where people now, because of that, they've invested in the quality, they've invested in the animal health, in the veterinary aspects of the of the cattle, yeah. so that they can fetch more money. And if that thing can spread throughout, you know, the yeah. whole country, and people become aware. Yeah. They become conscious of this disease. Then, you know, in the end, 
we start even looking for more, you know, for yeah. more capital because everybody has become aware, everybody is conscious of the, 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 the aspects, you know, the quality aspects of the, of the, of the, of the animals. Mm. And then we'll actually be, we won't be talking about the red line anymore because people themselves have taken the initiative to ensure that their cattle are vaccinated, yeah. their cattle are done. And then they will also make sure that if they know that, no, look, a certain area, uh, maybe in the neighboring countries, they've got, they are prone to these diseases. Yeah. They will also minimize the contacts because yes. they will know the impact it will have on the on the on the on the final in the you know uh, the bottom line so to speak yes. so they will then start to take their own measures exactly. and that's why i'm saying i was saying earlier that the, the red line unfortunately has made all of us lazy to yes. the extent say look no look we know that the food and mouth is won't come here because yes. there's a red line the red yes. line will take care of that yes. instead of us now being more proactive and actually going then even help to see so that those guys can also cope with this thing you know um, uh, much better indeed yeah. Yeah. so so the mulugani the <coughs> the argument that uh, a lot of people use in defense of, of this fence mm -hmm. is the commercial aspect of it that that you know it, 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 it helps maintain a very lucrative market. Now can you use that argument to convince a person in Odimbo or Dibo um, to say, oh no, we can't remove that fence because people on the other side are doing very well. Something that personally but perhaps doesn't benefit them directly. Can I convince the person in you know, Odibo that, no, let's maintain the thing because people on the other side are making enough money? Ab absolutely not. Um, because ideally, when, when you look at the lucrative, and, 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 and as a student of economics, so I, I am still trying to get the, the, the economic value, uh, whether we, if, if, if unfortunately now it's mixed with socialism, so that the economic value on a private capitalist state in terms of that's an individual basis, we see that economic value that uh, many farmers have gotten out of it. Mm. But we are simply then saying, let, let's, let's share the cake because the cake is big enough. Mm. Because if, 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 if we're talking about pricing, uh, of course, uh, Midco may, may be the end, end beneficiary because then if 30 of us used to charge Midco yeah. per kg this much, when now Midco has a variety of people supplying to it, the prices will drop. Mm. But this is what the benefit of it is. So mm. when you look at um, your, your output levels, they would shoot up immediately because the cheaper you, you, you're now supplying to Midco, the broader the market that we're now getting out there. And, mm. and, and whether I was just speaking about the Chinese market alone mm. and saying if, if the problem is, is people being lazy and saying, no, no, let's just re remain EU, uh, branch out here a bit to the UK, I mean to China, we get branch out a bit here to, to the US market, but we've, we've not even explored the African market as yet. Mm. So th there's many opportunities to say, look, we're, we're not uplifting the, the red line, but the southern guys would remain and say they are trading with the EU because of the standards and the quality of beef that they must maintain. Because remember, if you open it up today, it doesn't mean that even the, us or Mangeti farmers would essentially qualify to supply our beef to the EU market. Mm. Because we still need to up our game. Because, and remember, you, you're now giving us a choice and say, where, in which category do you want to be? Even us at subsistence level, level we've taken initiatives to know the vaccines, to know the, 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 the feeds that we must give our cattle, if you want to sell a kettle at, at a specific rate. I can guarantee you the, we, the other day I was in Khrotob and you're looking at one kettle that went for, that bull went for 1.7 million, it's a recent auction. And the guy says, I, I, I breed the very same bull. The only problem that I would not qualify to get that amount of money is because I have not traced and created the best certificate for this bull. Mm. We have farmers who are specifically looking into a specific breed and the mere fact that we were lazy enough not to keep paperwork and convince the next person or keep the, the record, just like when a baby is small, when it goes for the, the two weeks vaccine, there's a record. So we don't keep some of those records and once you then introduce that and say, colleagues, we've opened up the market, mm. but the market is now open that for those that want to participate economically, these are the rules and these are the standards. Because remember, when there are no rules and standards, there will be chaos. Mm. So we are conscious of what we are getting ourselves into and say, us from the other side, who wants to actively participate in, the, in, 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 in this economic sphere, mm. there is now a broader aspect of the rules and regulations that we must comply with. Mm. So if it means that I have uh, 
20 hectares of land in the Okavango area, and now I need to ensure that I have control in terms of my animal. We have also automatically it's now <laughs> personalized our ear tags that we already do. But do we keep records of our animal? Maybe that's where we must then mm. go. The type of vaccines, how frequent we must do it, and how often we must do it. And a specific market can be opened and say, this specific meat is opened up for this specific uh, uh, market. Mm. Remember, Namibia, we, we, send, we stand a very good chance because remember in South Africa now, mm. uh, almost all of their products mm. have GMO in it. It's, it's artificial. People do not get the quality that they used to get before. Mm. So ideally, Botswana and Namibia becomes your second market for investors. Mm. We, we, we are so much strategically positioned to a point where even the few that currently benefit see the benefits, but if they could, they would want to ensure that their cattle gives birth five times in a year <laughs> to have more production. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not the case. Yeah. So if we are able to then look and say, how do we expand beyond ourselves mm. and we include the greater country? I, I, I was laughing when I saw the other statistics to say Midco would lose six billion. So if Midco had gotten six billion, where did that six billion go? Is, is it not in the same country where we are? Mm. So we, we can't put up figures for the sake of putting up, raising an argument. Mm. But we must be practical in our arguments to say, we are simply not saying, remove the red line. I now take my cattle from Odibo and bring them to Mitko. No, I, even if I bring them to Mitko, they will be subjected to a quarantine period. And I can guarantee you by the time the quarantine period is over, I would not have even sold one because of the quality of the beef that I produce. And yes. also it would encourage us who are closer to Angola and have many of our cattle in Angola to actually go get them now yeah. and improve our ways of farming. Indeed. We go for another break and then I'll come back for the last stretch. So, Wadova, you, you spoke earlier about um, the prices that just a kg can fetch now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how better things have gotten as far as beef is concerned. Um, but that is just in favor of you as a farmer. Me as a consumer, I'm in trouble. Yes. Um, do you think, again, that therefore that the removal of that fence will also help consumers at my level, the downstream, to also have, because of, of, of the, the demand and supply thing will kick in, and then the price is also, I mean, for you, it will be, it will be yes. bad, yes. but for me, it's also a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, no, look, that's what I mentioned earlier. Of course, you know, there's the basic economics that, you know, as you increase the supply, you know, for the same demand, obviously, you know, it will mm. affect the price. You know, the price will come down, and that will be for the benefit of the consumer. Mm. Um, so for the producer, obviously, it will be a problem. That's mm. what I was mentioning earlier. But then it's not just a problem that it will be a short-term, you know, a problem. Mm. So the solution will be to look at the long-term solution, which yeah. is in terms of uh, increasing a market access. Yeah. Because we have not explored all the market. Because the thing is that we are conditioned on saying, look, we have only the one million south of the of the of the red line. Mm. So our marketing was uh, geared towards that, mm. and even that was not enough. Mm. You know, uh, especially now with the drought, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. Now even Midco and people are actually applying for permission to be able to to buy cattle from 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 Botswana and, and, and other countries. You mm. know, mm. so so bring in more cattle. Will of course they will have a there will always be a shock in the market. You yes. know, but the idea is that every time there's a shock, then we have to re-strategize and mm. reposition. You know, because ultimately you want to have as much uh, market access for everybody as possible because mm. that's the potential that is lying there yeah. and it has to be um, 
you know, uh, exploited, you know, uh, in, a, in a positive sense, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but ultimately, it's for me as a farmer, not so, of course, I would like to, um, to maximize my profit, but not at the expense, you know, of, 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 the, of, the, of the consumer. Mm -hmm. The idea is that for me to diversify, mm -hmm. because at the moment, uh, it has also made us lazy in the sense that I'm only now depending, cattle is my main source of income, mm -hmm. but on a 5,000 hectare, there's so much more I can do in, in addition to just the, the livestock farming. I've got, I've got a lot of dolls out there. I can, you know, I can actually sell for, you know, for furniture. Mm -hmm. I can. I've started now with a project also to uh, make my own feed. You know, from this uh, we call it umtiate to you know kill out. You know, mm -hmm. so by. Uh, by milling the leaves and mixing it, you know, so I can actually do my own kettle fodder. So that's also a source of revenue. Other people are selling grass. Mm. They're planting this blow buffer, you know, and then they, are, you know, and then they, they, they bale it and they, you know what I'm saying? So, so that will also force us to look at other uh, uh, revenue streams mm. instead of only de depending on the kettle. Mm. And of course, once we improve the, uh, the quality also, because the things that remember, the price is per kg. Mm. So if I can improve through breeding and so forth, you know, increase the, the size of my kettle, I can also for the same one number of, uh, one head of kettle, um, instead of now selling 300 kgs, I will not be able to sell 400 kgs. So mm. I'll be able to make up for that. So there are many techniques mm. that one can, can employ in order to, to still, you know, maintain that uh, profitability in the, in the market. And there are many ways of doing that. If we had more time, maybe another discussion, we can look at those techniques. Mm. Because I was also attending a farmer's day the other day, and we look at that, and he was talking about helping our people. And I can tell you, the, the quality has improved. Mm. People have started to learn, you know, even the, the record keeping, because the, the the major difference between the commercial herd and the stud breeder is that the market, uh, the, the records, mm. the records must be there. You know, once the calf is born, it must be weighed, and then you monitor the weight gain, yeah. and therefore the performance, and then they've got what they call these uh, estimated breeding values to look at the statistically looking at the averages and whether, you know, your stock is above or below. You know, it has become a scientific you know, yeah, way, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, enterprise. And mm. that is where we need to gear towards. And that for me is the, the biggest. Uh, uh, excitement, you know, about mm. the possibility, and even now the technology, even uh, managing, and that is one uh, maybe idea I wanted to throw in also about the, the the control, because now there are some countries like in Australia and in the US where they have these large heads where they have no fences. Mm. They're using like electric ways now, mm. where they at certain demarcations there they they use electric uh, ways of controlling you know the movement of cattle. So a cow will come there. And next to the, there's no physical fence, mm. but then there will be an electric signal sent, and then the cow will know that no, this is the end, or there's the boundary, mm. and it will actually shock the animal. And then slowly, you know, of course, without killing it, and then it will change direction. Sure. So all these techniques are there, and there are ways of also where they're monitoring you know, with remote sensing, you know, with satellites and so on. They will mm. be able to detect also, you know, the movement of herds, mm. and 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 I think there are some people who are doing studies also to see whether through remote sensing they will be able to detect maybe through heat sensing and so on. Mm. Uh, certain footprints they can find about certain diseases, yes. whether they will be able to monitor the outbreaks, you know. Yes. There are people, you know, there are some countries that are advanced in this, and that's, the, I think, where we need to go towards, you know. Definitely. And say, so, look, because, I mean, thing is just a disease, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's just a disease now. We're forgetting about the, look, we know that the political aspect of the red line, I mean, those are detestable, you know, oh, we're not oh. even discussing that. So our main challenge now is the disease control. Yes. And, and the techniques are there. There are a lot of research, you know, it's just that we don't have time now to go into a lot of the papers that have been written now about mm. how to do this thing mm. here, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, it's just that I think once we move away from the aspect of quality control and economic strangulation of certain people, yeah. I think once we moved away from that, then it becomes the collective effort of saying, look, guys, now how do we improve that? Because we know that if, if there are pockets, and just like with the social aspect as well, if mm. you have pockets of people that are, marginalized that are living below poverty lines and then you have the the affluent people think that because i'm affluent i'm living in ludisdorf in a gated community and so on i'm fine you know but ultimately we know <laughs> that the impact would ultimately have so it will be in the best interest of all of us yes. whether we are south or north of the red line yes. to actually deal with this thing here mm -hmm. and no more talk i would say like in the next 10 years and, and i know that there was a cabinet decision because i was reading an article actually in 2004 by Honorable Helmut Angula, at that time he was the Minister of Agriculture, where he actually the cabinet took a decision mm. 
to deal, uh, to do away with the red line. I think at that time they were looking at 10 years from there. I think already by 2015, mm. the red line was supposed to have been gone. Yeah, yeah. You know, so <clears> the <throat> decisions are there. Everything is there. It's only the modalities that, you know, technology. Now, how do we do that? And I think that is where we must focus all our attentions. Yeah. Where we say, guys, look, let's maybe look at a few case studies. You know, how did other people deal with that? Mm. You know, um, and in and, and Botswana, for instance, also, I was just having a paper today. I was reading, you know, about some people there who were looking, they'd done some research about even the perceptions of people about the red line zone, because they're also having problems. They also have a red line because they're bordering countries that are not paying uh, is, is, is the, the attention that is required in order to control the diseases. Indeed. So I believe very strongly that I don't think we can be beaten by a disease called foot and mouth disease. Yeah, yeah. And there's uh, yeah, these other diseases that are infectious and so on, because they were talking about even some other diseases that are airborne. Sure. That even when you have a red line, <laughs> this, this, they were still <laughs> just like they're trying to do the wall, you know, uh, Trump's wall in Mexico, you know. Yeah, for <laughs> you sure. Know, <laughs> you know, things like that. So I think that is where the discussion is. It must really be broad, and I yeah. think we need to really liberate ourselves yes. from the bondage and, and from the mental perceptions about what this red line is about. Yeah, sure. Some of us, some people have really come to believe that that is the thing that will help save our livestock industry when in fact it's actually destroying the livestock yeah. industry you yeah. know yeah. so i think once we liberate ourselves mentally to start to understand the benefits of that and and then actually collectively look at ways of how do we really make sure that our our, our livestock mm. um uh, can be can be protected against that and like i was saying earlier even people south of the rail uh, the red line once there is a, a, a buffalo that is you know left a farm somewhere else yeah. then the whole area is actually then blocked out you know Indeed. people cannot sell yeah. Uh, we know there were a lot of jokes that were there about Onyati, you know, you know, she wrote, wrote Onyati, you know, <laughs> yeah. Onyati, so there's nothing we can do, you know, it's not even affecting the sexuality of some guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because you. there's nothing they can do. So, so it's a problem everywhere. Yeah, sure. You know what I'm saying? You yeah, know, the yeah. existence or absence of a red line is, should not really be the focus. Yeah. It should be the focus of how do we how do we control. And it could be food and mouth disease. And maybe in the next five years, once we've taken care of that, there will be another disease. Yeah, exactly. You know, that now yeah. doesn't even respect any boundary at all. Where mm -hmm. we now need to really put our heads together. And that's why I'm saying that uh, we have Professor Angombe, for instance, who is in charge of the, you know, the faculty there of agriculture and, that, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, life sciences at, at UNAM, and we have uh, now a veterinary school at, uh, at UNAM, and I mm -hmm. think uh, NAST is also moving in the same direction. And we have a lot of young people, and we even have now, there's uh, one uh, lady, I think, uh, Kaurivi, Dr. Kaurivi, she's just gotten her PhD now, you know, in veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of uh, Namibians now who are coming up, and I think we need to, the, the, the tertiary institution must come in there, and yes. have really, uh, what do they call, it? applied research, yes. you know, solving problems in Namibia, not just having papers for the sake of just having a PhD, which all of us, of course, want to do, you know, Indeed. just quote a few people and then get your doctorate and you're gone. But actually see then maybe yeah. even and fund certain uh, uh, research streams in a way industry can also come there and say, look, like they do in other countries where yeah. big industries actually come and say, look, now we have a chair for let's say disease control, for instance, we are putting in a billion Namibia dollars, you know? Good. So please find this thing in the next two years. And because in some countries like where I am now, I don't have a problem with disease, but I have a problem, for instance, what they call Oshikurioma, this uh, plant, you know, a uh, poison plant yeah, yeah, yeah. that kills cattle. I mean, that thing there, you know, if, you don't, if you're not careful, it can, it can kill, you know, your whole head. So now <laughs> I need to apply my, my, my techniques now and skills towards how do I manage, you yeah. know, the poison plant, for instance. Good. So that is why I'm saying that I think maybe at the risk of repeating myself again on, on looking at the, the global gra agrarian reform yes. so that we start to look at agriculture as, a, as, a, as, as an import, as a mainstay of our economy. Yes. Because it's one of, it's the largest employer. You know, I think we, they were saying that almost 30% mm. of employment actually is deriving from agriculture. Good and point. that is still with the way that is still under, and that includes the communal areas, you yes. know. Yes. Uh, yes. Now you can, and, but yet the contribution to the GDP is only about, I think the highest was 5.1%. Yeah. So if we can actually put all our resources and open up all of these markets and so on, we will see that I'm looking forward to the day when agriculture will contribute up to 20, up north of 25% uh, of, uh, of, of the GDP. GDP. Then we are talking. Exactly. Then we'll be forgetting about all these uh, small issues <laughs> of red line and yeah, so on. Yeah. And then we'll be talking about really taking agriculture to the next level. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no, thank you, Wazuba. Yeah. Um, the the you and I are from the northern side of, the, of this fence. Mm. And um, in our villages where we come from, um, we, the language that we speak, as far as livestock is concerned, it's not the same language as what is saying here. Mm. He's talking about you know, commercialization, about you know, 
profit making out of these activities and we are very passionate ourselves mm. uh, there as far as the same activities are concerned. Do you think that uh, if markets are opened up where people now can see, where a grandmother can see that, uh, a grandfather can see that uh, cattle is no longer just a, a matter of uh, traditional pride, but that you can actually send your children to school, you can, your grandchildren to school, and uh, build a, a better homestead and stuff like that. Do you think opening up this thing will also open the eyes of communities in those areas to start really looking at the commercial side of farming? Absolutely, and I think we have already started. Uh, I, of course, there's no English way of saying this. Uh, I can tell you now, my father would probably not know the taste of an A-grade meat. Because what we sell, ohove, it's like an old kettle, mm. uh, old ox. Uh, and then on Dumetana, which is the A-grade meat, is the one that we pride ourselves to say, I have so many of them, uh, but they must eventually grow old and go and uh, be sold later. Mm. So when you are looking, and that is why you would see that if you attend uh, any function, particularly weddings or funerals, maybe funerals is okay, but weddings, uh, would, would look at the, 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 not even the quality and texture of the meat of the kettle that you're bringing. So if I bring on the metana, then it's like an insult. How do you bring me something this small? Mm. But it, it is quality beef. Mm. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so mm. we, we respect the big guy and mm. big and tall, and then that's the one that they are selling. Yeah. Yeah. On do, on do long yeah. horns that are facing yeah. this way and that way. And that is what we, we pride ourselves yeah. in. Yeah. Unfortunately, and you, you, you see that thing being sold for 15,000, but yeah. Yeah. for what reason? Mm. Maybe just to go kill it then. But for, for essential farming, and in, in, in what Kambi was saying earlier is that, you see, we, we have moved psychologically away from subsistent farming mm. to wanting to venture into commercial farming. Mm. But unfortunately, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter how much you put in, I, I know a guy who is farming close to, just close to Etosha, mm. and, and he, he, he has about 500 heads of, of cattle. Mm. Good quality beef, but unfortunately he can't bring it on the other side of the red line because, hello, the, <laughs> the, you, you are at the risk zone. So e economically, all, all we are asking for is two things. Is, is to have an economic participation in, in the broader market. And we are not simply saying that we want to in, enter into the UK market. What if we have our own market and say, we are looking into the, the, the northern side of Africa. Mm -hmm. How do we move into that broader aspect of, of, of actually moving our meat into other parts of, of, of the continent? Because they already, even just um, locally, I can tell you now, the A-grade meat we eat is the ones we, we buy from spa or a butchery, if you can afford. But what it would translate into, and this is the worst thing about what we produce in this country, we do not enjoy the best of what we do. The A-grade meat in this country is difficult to get unless it's imported. But the locally produced A-grade meat would only know if I'm a friend to uh, Mr. Kaumbi. Because when he slaughters that on the metana, I'm, I'm closer to him and I would, would get the, the, that first taste. But when we are able to say what can we, even just the domestic market, we've never even looked at saying maybe the northern side of the red line, if properly taken care of, can supply the A-grade meat or B-grade meat or C-grade meat to the local market so that we just get a taste of what we are producing. So, of course, what we are confident about is that our people are able to do and work because sometimes it doesn't even require government to lift a single dollar. The upliftment with conditions automatically means now, if I want to participate, yes. I must comply. Yes. What does compliance mean? I now need to seriously invest and say, if I now need the, the 20 hectares we are now given by government, to say, in the, our 20 hectares where we can put our homestead in Mahango field, instead of planting Mahango 24 hours, or throughout all these 20 years, 50 years we've lived there, mm. we can now separate and say, 10 hectares of the 20 hectares, yeah. would be specifically to be a camp divided into two, five, five, and this is how we are going to manage our cattle. Yes. To avoid our cattle now roaming with our neighbor's cattle because our neighbor has no interest in uh, the economic aspect of it, yeah. but would continuously just want to feed this family and yes. for pride. But yes. I who want to take measures further 
can be afforded an opportunity to want to explore. Because so we would point. be able to then move in that direction and say that uh, things would move in that, that aspect. You've made your point. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Uh, time is not uh, on our side now, but um, it's always an absolute pleasure to have conversations like this. And uh, I hope to get you back again on the, on the set for even other conversations. So, Mr. Uh, Kombi, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Toys. Thank you, young man, for coming. No, thank you, Toivo, and the red line will fall. <laughs> <laughs> it's already fallen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is uh, Wadua Kaumbi. He's a farmer uh, yeah, in the, on the southern side of the fence. Very close to the fence, but just slightly. <laughs> it's neighboring the fence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dimulogani Naoyama is an activist of the uh, affirmative repositioning movement that is uh, calling also for the fall of this fence. That is the end of the show, but uh, take care of yourselves. COVID-19 is serious. We have uh, started going over the mark of 1,000 cases per day, and that is not a small number. So we have to take care of ourselves and uh, for the sake of ourselves and the family. Good night. <laughs>